And you cannot love Mike Patton and Anthony Kiedis because they are two different people and you have to love Mike Patton. You cannot love Anthony Kiedis. What's up, everybody? I'm Finn McKenty. This is the Punk Rock NBA. And today we are here to talk about Mr. Bungle, which, depending on what album and what song you listen to, could be anything from ska to death metal to lounge jazz to, I don't know, like the soundtrack to a movie that doesn't even exist. To give you an idea of what I mean, Mr. Bungle is anything from this. <laughs> To this. And pretty much anything in between. And you might think of them as Mike Patton from Faith No More's side project, but it's really more accurate to say that Faith No More is the side project. And despite Mr. Bungle only having three real albums in 38 years of existence, and their music being, well, incredibly bizarre and deliberately inaccessible, somehow they've quietly become one of the most influential bands in the last 30 years of rock and metal. With many bands like Avenged Sevenfold, Korn, and Dillinger Escape Plan, who are all legends in their own right, giving the band credit as a massive influence. And so the question is, how do they do it? And what is Mr. Bungle's lasting impact and influence? Those are the questions that I will answer in this video. And also, this video is sponsored by World of Warships. It's a free-to-play game available on PC with new content released every month. New ships, in-game nations, cosmetics, or even ship classes. For example, my personal favorite, their collab with Azure Lane. And from November 16th until November 30th, there's an in-game collaboration event between World of Warships and the popular High School Fleet anime series. And if you want to check out World of Warships, download it now at the link in the description of this video. World of Warships has more than 40 unique maps with dynamic weather. You can conquer the oceans aboard history's most iconic battleships. Oh, and did I mention it's also available on consoles? And during registration, use the code HSF2023 to receive a huge starter pack, including 200 doubloons, 1 million credits, seven days of premium account time, and two high school fleet commanders. So download World of Warships now at the link in the description and enjoy that amazing starter pack. I first heard Mr. Bungle back in 1993 when a kid in my art class who somehow found out that I liked metal played me their first album, but the band's origins go back quite a bit earlier than that. They started out in 1985 in Eureka, California, which is kind of a small, nice touristy town in Northern California. A nice place to grow up, but not exactly a hotbed for music. And for whatever reason, they decided to name the band after a character from a 1950s educational film that they had seen on Pee Wee's Playhouse. In the puppet show, Mr. Bungle came to the boys' room on his way to lunch. They played their first show at the end of 1985 and did their first recording in 1986 called The Raging Wrath of the Easter Bunny. And obviously the recording is pretty rough, but for 1986, this is incredible stuff. Remember, this was only a year after Seven Churches by Possessed came out, which is widely considered to be the very first death metal recording ever. So the fact that they were this early to the genre when they were still in high school is pretty amazing. But even this early when they were still just a death metal band, you could hear traces of what they would later become. Like in the song Evil Satan, which adds some kind of funky slap bass, horns, and even a train whistle. After that, they recorded three more demos, first Bowel of Chili in 1987, and after getting into bands like Fishbone, they had already moved away from the death metal sound in favor of, well, whatever you want to call this. <laughs> They followed that up with their next demo called God Damn It, I Love America in 1988. 
and in 1989, OU818, which in my opinion is where they really came into their own as a band, adding keyboards, saxophone, trumpet, and more to their lineup. They were barely out of their teen years and their music was really only half serious, but even this early, you could still tell that they were just incredibly talented musicians, mashing together just this incredibly wide range of influences, from death metal to jazz to ska to movie soundtracks and really just about anything else. And as for how they came up with this just bizarre combination of influences, their guitarist Trey Spruance said, 400 miles from anywhere pre-internet, we were receiving our cultural reference in a way that could be compared to breathing through a tiny straw. And in some way, therefore, we were free from their actual influence, free to imagine them any way we wanted to. How do you concentrate on making a song for one project or the other? Because they are so different. It's easy. It's uh, like when you go into the bathroom and uh, your body tells you whether it's time to piss or shit. It's the same exact concept. You don't think about it. It's instinctive and it just happens. And after releasing all those demos, they were still basically a completely unknown underground band, but some people were paying attention. And one of those people was Jim Martin, the guitarist of another Bay Area band that you may have heard of called Faith No More. As Faith No More drummer Mike Borden said, talking about the Raging Wrath of the Easter Bunny demo, Trey gives me the tape and Jim loves it because it sounds like Slayer. It sounds like speed metal with death growls and all this crazy stuff. And I'll never forget it. Jim turns around and says to us, this guy has got to be this giant fat guy with all the power he's got in his voice. And time goes by and then when we were looking for a new singer, Jim was like, let's get that big fat guy from Mr. Bungle. And Faith No More did get him, announcing Mike Patton as their new singer in January of 1989, followed shortly by their first album with him called The Real Thing, which kind of unexpectedly became this like massive mainstream hit, thanks to MTV playing the video for their song Epic, featuring Mike Patton in a Mr. Bungle t-shirt. And as the LA Times said at the time, quote, under normal circumstances, you'd have to describe Mr. Bungle's chances of landing a major label deal as a long shot. And it may have been a long shot, but that is exactly what happened. Mr. Bungle signed with Warner Brothers and finally released their very first real album in 1991, which was mostly songs from their demos re-recorded with the help of the producer John Zorn, who was also an iconic avant-garde jazz musician in his own right. And even with the songs being a few years old, and I think the band being mostly kind of tired of them, it it was still shockingly weird and different, especially to the mainstream audience who discovered them through the Faith No More pipeline. The album was not exactly the commercial hit that Warner Brothers was hoping for, and critics definitely didn't like it. For example, Entertainment Weekly said, quote, adjectives like puerile and unlistenable take on entirely new dimensions when applied to Mr. Bungle which I would imagine when the band read that, they absolutely loved it. But thanks to the Faith No More Association and it being on a major label with incredible distribution and record stores everywhere, it did get attention outside that kind of tiny, small tape trading scene that had heard their demos. And the people who heard it had their minds blown. One of those people was Head from Korn. Another one of our uh, inspirations were a band called Mr. Bungle. I don't even know, some of those songs are... the hell is that you know back in 89 or whatever it's like so when we started blind you know we we uh came up with that intro that weird chord another person who noticed mike Patton, but was maybe not quite so enthusiastic was anthony kiedis of the red hot chili peppers who apparently felt like mike was copying him as Anthony said years later, I love the real thing and I liked his vocals on that record. I mean, when I heard the record, I noticed subtle similarities, but when I saw that video, I was like, wait a second here, what the fuck? Implying somehow that Mike Patton was copying his look and his style of dancing and just like his overall vibe. Personally, I would be pretty surprised if Mike Patton actually did take influence from the Chili Peppers, but Anthony Kiedis obviously didn't see it that way. We usually say a little prayer. We all get together and kind of put our hands together like this, kind of like the Chili Peppers do. We Just copied it from them, thing. like everything else. In years down the line, that rivalry would actually play a huge role in destroying Mr. Bungle, but I will get to that later. 
And before I do, if you like this video, I would love it if you would hit that subscribe button. It helps the channel and it makes sure that you don't miss any of my videos. And for as innovative and mind-blowing as Mr. Bungle's first album was to the people who heard it, by the time it came out, they had already moved on. After all, a lot of those songs were several years old, and this is stuff that they wrote when they were still teenagers. As their bassist Trevor Dunn said years later, quote, Though I look back on some of this music with horror, I think it really represented us in our youthful small-town escapism. Which I think is a fair assessment. Personally, I think the album is cool for its time, but in my opinion, it's really the least interesting thing that they've done. Which brings us to my personal favorite Mr. Bungle release, their second album, Disco Volante in 1995, which just completely abandoned the kind of circus metal thing from the first album. To put it bluntly, this album is just bizarre. As one reviewer said at the time, quote, Mr. Bungle is the musical equivalent of a David Lynch movie, a totally original and new musical style, and an album that sounds like nothing else that currently exists. Which I think is an accurate way to describe it. It is truly post-genre. Going from jazz... to death metal... to pretty much everything else, including even obscure stuff like Klezmer. And those genre changes are not just track to track, sometimes they're even within the same song. No joke, there could be easily five or six different genres in one track, just kind of like switching on a dime with no real rhyme or reason. One reviewer described this album as, quote, oral montages rather than songs, for short sections erupt and suddenly disappear, replaced by another passage with little connection to what preceded it. And I think the reviewer meant that in a negative way, but personally, that's exactly why I like this album. And it sounds like it would just be a jumbled, disjointed mess, but at least to me, somehow it sounds weirdly cohesive as an album. The genre changes are totally abrupt and nonsensical, and yet somehow they work. To me, it kind of feels like I'm listening to the score of an incredibly bizarre movie that doesn't exist. For example, like half the lyrics are basically just nonsense gibberish. But when I listen to it, there's like very clear imagery that comes into my head and I feel like I can visualize exactly what the song is about. Even though I'm almost certainly wrong, it kind of doesn't matter. Another thing that I've always loved about Mr. Bungle and Mike Patton's projects in general is their willingness to subvert expectations and basically just fuck with their fans. For example, I know a lot of people were expecting this album to be more funk metal like the first record, but the band almost deliberately set out to disappoint them. As Trey said years later, Mr. Bungle isn't at all about rocking. It's more attuned to the post-rock avant-garde mindset and thrives on dashing not just the expectations of early 90s funk metal fans, but also those modern modernist pretensions held so dear by the aforementioned avant retro snobs. In other words, whatever you think we are, whatever you want us to be, we're not that, so fuck you. Which brings us to their third album, California, which came out in 1999, and to use Trey's words, is definitely the least rocking thing in their catalog. Which you can tell the label was sort of trying to prepare people for in the press release announcing the album, saying that, quote, the album is sure to alienate those expecting weird meter changes and heartless vulgarities. And it was probably smart for them to manage expectations like that, because California sounds a lot more like a 1960s soft rock album or the soundtrack to some forgotten movie than it does the death metal or the disjointed noise that people knew them from before. And as for the change in direction, I think Mr. Bungle are just one of those bands that's never going to be content staying in one place. That's just not who they are. I think these are people who are driven by exploring new territory. So by the time fans have caught up with where they're at, they've already moved on to the next thing. As Trey Spruins put it, some fans may get mad because we're not playing quote unquote experimental music. We don't really care. We've made a pact to trust our musical instincts and not worry about people's expectations. We could keep putting out quote unquote weird records and be pretty comfortable, but that would get a little thin. We want the freedom to try new things and have fun. And you might be wondering how a major label like Warner Brothers gave the band so much freedom to experiment and change up their sound in ways that were almost guaranteed to piss off the audience. And the answer seems to be that the label barely even knew they existed, let alone had any kind of stake in the direction of their next album. As Trevor Dunn described it, when we were mixing, our A&R guy from Warner Brothers came down to the studio to check out the new stuff. 
I was upstairs with him playing a mix of Retro Vertigo when he suddenly got bored and walked out of the room right in the middle of the song. It became clear to me that the only reason we were still on this major label was because they were hoping for a Faith No More hit. Another funny example of the industry kind of not really knowing what to do with them was when they got booked on the 2000 edition of the Snowcore Tour, which as you might guess from the name was the sort of snowboarding slash alternative music tour with System of Down, Incubus, and Puya, where California era Mr. Bungle was not exactly well received. With the audience throwing stuff at them on a bunch of shows and basically booing them off the stage half the time. And although this album is a fan favorite, for me personally, it's actually my least favorite Mr. Bungle release. But with that being said, I respect it specifically because it's not what I expected or wanted them to do. And remember what I said about the Red Hot Chili Peppers beef from 10 years ago? That was about to make a comeback. The first issue came in 1999 when Warner Brothers moved back the release date of Mr. Bungle's album California, which was originally scheduled to come out the same day as the Red Hot Chili Peppers album called Californication. And this actually seems understandable to me because Red Hot Chili Peppers are obviously a much bigger band and it could be kind of confusing for people to see two albums with such similar names come out the same day but people wondered was there more to it than just that and the answer seems to be that yes there was more to it than that Mr. Bungle had booked several dates on some big European festivals that year. Those festivals pay very well, and a lot of American bands essentially make their entire living just playing that summer European festival circuit. And Red Hot Chili Peppers were headlining several of those festivals. And once Anthony Kiedis heard that Mr. Bungle was also playing on those festivals, he allegedly had them kicked off the shows. They kicked us out of the bill because... Uh, he doesn't want the bass competition, that's why. I guess not. And I, and I, think, I think Anthony deep down feels like I'm a better dancer than he is. I think I, sh I think I shake my booty just a little bit, just a little bit fresher than he does. If he would stop doing drugs, I think he could outdance me. And so in retaliation, Mr. Bungle did a set in Pontiac, Michigan. And I don't know if it's a coincidence, but Michigan is Anthony Kiedis's home state where they dressed up as Red Hot Chili Peppers and did just like deliberately awful covers of a bunch of their songs with like these badly drawn on tattoos and pretending to inject drugs on stage, making fun of the Red Hot Chili Peppers history with addiction. Anthony Kiedis was obviously not happy with that and had them kicked off of the upcoming Big Day Out Festival in Australia, which put an even bigger strain on a band that was already strained. At the time, Trey said that, quote, even in the best of all possible situations that we are in now, none of us can support ourselves financially with Mr. Bungle. And so getting kicked off of these festivals and missing out on that payday just made things even harder. As Trevor Dunn later said, everything you've ever heard about the Red Hot Chili Peppers screwing us is true. Ultimately, they screwed me out of a lot of money for which I will forever harbor anger. There were also some sort of interpersonal issues within the band of people not being able to get along, which was exacerbated by all the drama and financial hardship. And so in the wake of all of that, the band went on hiatus in 2001 until unexpectedly they came back in 2019 for a handful of shows and a re-recording of the Raging Wrath of the Easter Bunny demo, this time with modern production and the addition of Dave Lombardo from Slayer on drums and Scott Ian from Anthrax on guitar. And to my surprise, because normally people re-recording stuff from their youth like this sounds terrible, it actually sounds incredible. I think this is easily one of the best thrash albums in decades. And I have no idea what the future of Mr. Bungle will be, but that does bring us to the last question, which is what is their lasting legacy and influence? And this is a really interesting one because the band seems to basically disown their first album. When asked about it, Trey Spruins said, often I feel that the public that took to this album had pre-existing mental problems that the wide distribution of the CD only exacerbated. So when I hear about how this music affected these youngsters, it really just makes me sad, which I can totally understand, but the impact of that album Album can't be denied. As just one example, like I mentioned earlier, it inspired Korn, and Korn created new metal, which to this day is easily the most influential version of metal. But at the same time, I do understand Trey's perspective, and like I said, I think their first album is easily the least interesting thing that they've done. Another legendary band that takes obvious influence is Avenged Sevenfold. I uh, I like weird stuff. Mr. Bungle 
uh, is one of my favorite bands of all time, and I think their self-titled record, their debut record, self-titled, is one of the most in incredible pieces of music. For example, compare Avenged Sevenfold's song We Love You from their newest album <laughs> to Phlegmatics by Mr. Bungle off of Disco Volante. But to me, the real legacy of Mr. Bungle is that they introduced experimental music that doesn't revolve around guitar to the metal audience. And what I mean by that is that obviously they are a band with guitars, but after their demo, they were never really a guitar band per se. As Trey put it, it's funny, if you think about all the other Mr. Bungle music from a guitar perspective, there's not really one song where you can go, hey, play that riff. Sometimes people ask me to play one and none of them are really that interesting, which to me is a very meaningful contribution. Metal can be a very guitar focused genre. And so I think the fact that they were able to help people think bigger than just that is a very significant contribution to the world of metal. They were the gateway for a lot of metal fans to learn about people like John Zorn, Enrico Morricone, Burt Backrack, and a lot of other experimental avant-garde music that otherwise they probably never would have heard about. And as for the future of the band, I have no idea if they'll make more music, but if they do, I'm sure it'll be the last thing that any of us would expect from them, and I wouldn't have it any other way. All right, my friends, that does it for this video. As always, let me know what you think in the comments. And also, I want to thank everyone who supports me on Patreon, especially those of you who support at the True Cult level or above. Patrons get all my videos early. There are members-only channels in my Discord that I'm super active in. I do giveaways. And there's also a way to have me review your music. So if any of that sounds cool, hit the link in the description of this video. And with that, I'm going to sign off for now, but I will see you next time.